We are for the church and for the kingdom. This vision drives everything we do. There are many noble causes and institutions in this world, and we care about the future of seminaries, academies, governments, social causes, and parachurch ministries, but they are not fundamentally why we exist. We exist for the future of the church and the advancement of God's kingdom. With God's help, our students today will be the pastors, ministers, and missionaries of the global church tomorrow. We teach the Bible in the classroom so that generations of churches will be sturdy outposts of Christ's kingdom. This is how we serve the church, and this is how we bless every other good and noble endeavor until God's glory covers the earth like the waters cover the sea. Will you join us? Friends, if you have your copy of God's Word, I invite you to turn to the book of Titus, the book of Titus. While you're turning there, I'd like to open this morning with a story, a story I encountered a while ago. I believe it's a true story, and it's an interesting one. A number of years back, South London, Sunday morning service is coming to a close. As the Sunday morning sermon comes to a close, a man stands up in the back of a church in South London, and he says, excuse me, pastor, I'd like to share a testimony. Pastor looks at his watch, says, you have three minutes. Go. The man proceeded with his story. I just moved to this area. I used to live in Sydney, Australia. Just a few months back, I was visiting some relatives, and I was walking down George Street. You know where George Street is in Sydney, going from the business area out to the colonial area. A strange little white-haired man stepped out of a shop doorway, put a pamphlet in my hand, and said, Excuse me, sir, are you saved? If you die tonight... Are you going to heaven? I was astounded by these words. No one had ever asked me that. I thanked him courteously. And all the way home to London, his question puzzled me. I called a friend. Thank God he was a Christian. And he led me to Christ. That Baptist pastor had business in Australia. He had some meetings he was supposed to speak at. Ten days later, he was in Adelaide, Australia. In the middle of a three-day series there, a woman came up to him for some counseling. He wanted to establish where she stood with Christ. She said, I used to live in Sydney. And just a couple months ago, ago, I was visiting some friends there, doing some last-minute shopping down George Street. A strange little white-haired man stepped out of a shop doorway, offered me a pamphlet, and said, Excuse me, ma'am, are you saved? If you died tonight, are you going to heaven? I was disturbed by those words. When I got home to Adelaide, I knew of this Baptist church on the next block from me. I sought out the pastor, and he led me to Christ. So I'm telling you, I'm a Christian. The London pastor was now very puzzled. Twice in two weeks, he'd heard basically the exact same testimony. He then flew to preach in a church in Perth, Australia, for another set of meetings. When his teaching season was over, his teaching series was over, the senior elder of that church took him out to a meal. As they were talking, he asked the elder how he became a Christian. The elder began to share, I grew up in this church, and from the age of 15, I have been part of it. Because of my business ability, I rose up to a place of prominence. Never made any kind of decision for Christ, just hopped on the bandwagon because it was the thing to do. Three years back, I was doing some shopping in Sydney, Australia. As I was walking down George Street, an obnoxious, spiteful little man stepped out of a shop doorway, said, excuse me, sir, are you saved? If you die tonight, will you go to heaven? I tried to tell him I was a Baptist elder, but he wouldn't have anything to do with it. 
I was fuming all the way home and went to my pastor as I got home and told him this story thinking he would agree with my anger and contempt. But he too had been burdened for years knowing that I did not know Christ. And three years ago, my pastor led me to Christ. That pastor goes on in the testimony that he shares of these events, and he mentions how he shared this at a series of conventions he was preaching at. These stories, he just threw them in, and at the end of those, some pastors came up and shared with him how 25 to 30 years prior, they too had been led to Christ in part by the witness of that little man on George Street coming up to them. He then tells about how he was speaking at a conference of missionaries. He shared these testimonies there, and between 15 and 25 years prior there, that some missionaries had encountered this same man there on George Street and had come to know Christ. Then he was speaking at a conference of naval chaplains, and he goes out to lunch with the head chaplain general. And he asked the chaplain general how he became a Christian. The chaplain general says, it was miraculous. I was a sailor on a naval battleship, and I lived a wicked life. We were doing exercises in the South Pacific. We docked at Sydney Harbor for replenishments. We hit King's Cross with a vengeance. I was blind drunk, got on the wrong bus, got off, On, anyone want to guess? George Street. There you go. As I got off the bus, I thought I saw a ghost. This man jumped out in front of me, pushed a pamphlet in my hand, and said, Sailor, are you saved? If you die tonight, are you going to heaven? The fear of God hit me immediately. I was shocked sober, ran back to the ship, and sought out the chaplain. He led me to Christ. I soon began to prepare for the ministry under his guidance. And I'm now in charge of a thousand chaplains intent on leading others to Jesus Christ. Now, isn't this an interesting story? An interesting story of an interesting man and his faithful attempt to lead others to Christ. And I believe he had one idea standing behind him. And it's an idea I believe we see in the text we're about to look at. And here's the idea I wish to share with you today. I believe he had this notion with everyone he met. This person could become a Christian. This person could be saved. Indeed, anyone can be saved through the gospel Of Jesus Christ. And I believe our text this morning reveals that great truth anyone can be saved. Look with me, if you would, in Titus chapter 3, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 3, that will primarily focus on verses 4 through 8. And here's what Titus or Paul writes to Titus For we too were once. Foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, detesting one another. But look what Paul says next. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. Not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy. Through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit, he poured out his spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So that having been justified by grace, we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. This saying is trustworthy. I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed God might be careful to devote themselves to good works. These are good and profitable for everyone. Gracious Father, we come before you and we ask that your word would minister to us and it would speak to us. And the truth that anyone can be saved 
would cause each of us to be faithful, to share the good news, the story of your son, his love, and his salvation. We pray this in the power of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, amen. Friends, we see here in the text, I believe this great truth, anyone can be saved. And I believe our text answers three questions about this truth of anyone can be saved. I believe it answers the question of why anyone can be saved. And that's because it's the Father's will. It's the Father's plan. Second, how anyone can be saved through the Spirit's cleansing and empowering work. And third, when anybody can be saved. And that's when they receive the Son, Jesus Christ, and receive His grace and His mercy. Friends, look with me, if you would, again in the text, as we seek to answer this question, why anyone can be saved. Now notice here in verse 3, how Paul describes himself and the believers there in Crete. Foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, detesting one another. Lest you think these are good people, think about how they describe themselves, which Paul quotes for us in chapter 1, verse 12. A one of their very own prophets, Paul is writing to Titus, it's on the island of Crete there, and he says this, one of their very own prophets said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Cretans rejoiced in being wicked. They were like a combination of Las Vegas and New Orleans during Mardi Gras all wrapped into one. They rejoiced in being evil. These are the type of people who, when we think of them, we would think could not be any further from God. But what does Paul write next? But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and His love for mankind appeared. They were awful. They were sinking deep in sin far from the peaceful shore. And what happens? God's kindness and his love appears. Nothing in themselves, nothing of themselves deserving it. God shows up. And we see two really interesting words here. And they get paired together. His love and his kindness, his kindness and his love. And we see these two attributes there. And we note that this is a love that is for mankind, building on the idea in 3, chapter 2, to show gentleness to all people. Looking back to chapter 2, verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. And we see here clearly in the text that God's kindness and his love is for all. And as it comes and as it shows up and as it is there for all, it appears. Now these words love and kindness that we see there are kindness and love for mankind. They're This is the only time we see these two words paired in the Greek New Testament. The word love there, that's actually the only one of two times in the Greek New Testament we see that form for love. But you'll find these words paired oftentimes in extra-biblical literature. Specifically in literature that is about the government. About the characteristics, indeed, of good rulers. And how these words normally get paired in those places is they get paired in the context of how good rulers treat their people. And what folks have in mind when they talk about the kindness and love of their rulers is they have in mind tax rebates. They have in mind, thank you, Dr. Branch, 
They have in mind tax rebates. They have in mind public infrastructure projects. That, you know, there's Caesar off in Rome, and the Cretans want Caesar to lower their taxes, and they want him to build back Crete better. That's what they, they desire. That he would, from a distance, having nothing to do with them, make their lives easier. But notice, that's not what God does. God appears. He appears. He sends his son, and his son appears. And he appears in their lives, bringing salvation through the son that he has sent. And they know him not as some distant potentate who will not have anything to do with them, but as one who becomes a man in the person of the son who comes to save them. When they were awful, he comes in and shows them love and he shows them kindness. When they were, in the words of the text, foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, he comes in and he offers his salvation. This is the Father's plan to offer salvation in the Son, and to offer salvation to us. Why? Verse 5. He saved us, not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to His mercy. If you underline in your Bible, underline the words, He saved us, verses 4 through 7, one sentence. The main idea of that sentence, verse 5 there, He saved us. And how does He do it? Why does He do it? Out of His mercy. Out of His mercy. He has compassion towards us in our helpless state. And then not because of any of our righteousness. On the campus where I serve, Hannibal LaGrange University, this last semester has been a very interesting one in the life of our campus. I know you have heard, as I have heard, the stories of God's special work in certain places. And as is often the case with such things, those can be accompanied by excess or so forth. But what I do know is what I know has happened on our own campus in Hannibal. About two and a half months ago, or two months ago now, a number of our students began to meet in our student center for prayer. Just spontaneously got together and they started to pray. There was a planned night of worship. It was student-led that night on our campus. And that night of worship was set to begin at 7 o'clock. About 8 o'clock that night continued to go. They continued to pray. There was preaching of the word that was there. There was students who began to give testimonies of what was going. And a number of our students left the building at that point. And a number stayed, but the number who left went back to their dorms. And as they went back to the dorms, they began to go to their friends. We have students on our campus who are not Christians, and they begin to share with them the story of God's love, the story of God's mercy, the story of God's grace and His kindness and His compassion towards them, the story of God sending His Son to die for their sins. And God did what only God can do. And these students began to come back and pour in until two in the morning. They were praising God and students who've been far off from God, whose entire exposure to the gospel message up to that point had been hearing and coming to our chapel services on our campus, began to say, I need salvation from Jesus Christ. I need God to send his son, to send his spirit into my life, to regenerate me. Friends, it is the will of the Father to be loving, to be kind, 
towards all mankind from before time began. He determined to send his son and that his son would appear so that God's salvation might appear in our own lives. And if his son is how we have seen and come to know the Father is kind and He is merciful and that our righteousness is not enough to bring us into right relation, but that God has moved towards us, offering us salvation, then what are we to do? Well, according to verses 2 and 3, we're to be like the Father in this. To always be kind, showing gentleness to all people, remembering how we used to be. Friends, anyone can be saved. Why? Why? Because it's the Father's plan. It is. It is the Father's plan that anyone can be saved. Second, how Can anyone be saved? How can anyone be saved? Through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit, verse 5. He poured out His Spirit on us abundantly. How can anybody be saved? It's through the Spirit's work. The Spirit's work. Notice what the Spirit does here in the text. First, He washes us. He regenerates us through this washing. He renews us. There is a work of the Spirit of God that brings about salvation. And then He is poured out on us abundantly. He empowers us. He gives us new life. Now there's a lady who used to travel the Southern Baptist Convention and speak in churches and speak in various places. She was prostitute. And uh, and she heard the message of salvation and came to faith in Christ. And here's what she used to say as she gave her testimony. She said, I got on my filthy knees a harlot. I got up a pure virgin. You see, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. He cleanses. He takes us from our sinful state. He takes us from a state of sinking deep in sin without hope. I think of the story of John Newton, who I know y'all have celebrated this year, the 250th anniversary of Amazing Grace, and how he came to faith. And even after coming to faith, I love this story. He was still so messed up. He was on a boat, his slaving boat, and he got thrown over and his men hated him so much because he was such a jerk that they threw a harpoon rather than a rope to lift him up into the boat and they speared him in the side and hauled him back up. I mean, he was awful. And he would come back after that and fight the slave train and work for the good of others. He's the one who can write that great Him of faith. Why? Because of the cleansing work of the Holy Spirit. And not only does the Holy Spirit cleanse, He empowers. Look at the second half of it. He poured out His Spirit through us abundantly. He empowers us. Anyone been to Nebraska Furniture Mart lately. We don't have Nebraska Furniture Mart in Hannibal, but y'all have Nebraska Furniture Mart. I always loved going to Nebraska Furniture Mart. I could get lost in there. never want to spend any money. It was too high-end oftentimes for me to do that. But, but when I'd go into Nebraska Furniture Mart, I'd go to the appliance section, look at the big TVs, and then sometimes I'd wander over towards uh, the refrigerators and freezers. And one time I was there in Nebraska Furniture Mart, and there side by side is a 25.4 cubic foot Viking refrigerator. And there next to it is a 25.4 cubic foot Viking freezer. Anyone seen these things before? Anyone seen the price tag on them? $17,499.99. For the fridge. Same price for the freezer. 
$35,000 of refrigerator and freezer, and they're on sale. <laughs> Today, only $13,999.99. 28 grand. I actually checked the website. That's what they are today. And, uh, and suppose with me for a second, you went and you bought that refrigerator and you bought that freezer. You bought a new car, not a great car, but a new car, $28,000 worth of refrigerator and freezer. And you take those home with you. Or you have them deliver it to your house. And on your way home, you go by Costco and you stock up because you've got a new fridge and freezer coming. You buy $2,000 worth of groceries. You've got a th full 30 grand into this project right now. And you get home, and there they are, the new fridge, the new freezer, and they install them into your house there. You unload the groceries. They peel the little blue plastic off the front of it so that you're ready to go. And the next morning, you wake up. You go down to your new refrigerator. And you begin to smell, and the smell is terrible. You open it up, all the groceries rotting. Get on the phone. What's wrong with my new fridge and freezer? Why aren't they working? You need to come back here, and you need to pick them up, and you need to take them. I want my money back. And that person there on the other phone, they're patient, they're kind. He says back to you, sir, could you do me one favor? Could you put your ear up against the side of the fridge? Do you hear anything? No, no, I don't hear anything. Put your ear up against the side of the freezer. Do you hear anything? No, no, I don't, I don't hear anything. Sir, could you maybe just look around behind? Is there a cord there? Yes, yes, is there, there's a cord. Is it plugged in? No. No, it's not. They don't work. Why? Because they're not connected to power. You see, what does the Spirit of God do? He cleanses us. And he has poured out on us abundantly. He empowers us in that salvific process. He cleanses, he uh, regenerates, he renews, he empowers, he equips you for all that you need for the life of God. And some of us, dear Christians, were scared to death to go share the gospel with anybody. We're scared to death to venture out and say to someone, Jesus died for you. He died for your sins. He rose from the dead and you can have new life with him if you will repent and call on him in faith and know him as your Lord. And friends, the Spirit stands ready to empower you to the ministry he is calling you to of sharing his gospel. So first, first we see here in the text why anyone can be saved. Why? Because the Father has determined it. Second, we see here in the text how anyone can be saved. How can anyone be saved? Through the Holy Spirit who stands ready to cleanse and empower anyone who is saved. Third, we see here in the text when Anyone can be saved. They can be saved when they encounter the Son, Jesus Christ, ready to justify. Look what the text says, second half of verse 6. He poured out His Spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by grace, we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. When are we saved when we were justified. We were justified, according to the text here. When he, we saw 
His grace. By His grace, our sins were forgiven. So we've seen here in the text, mercy, that's not getting what we do deserve. And now we see grace, which is getting what we don't deserve. I like how Adrian Rogers used to put it. When he described grace, he, he described it this way, at God's riches at Christ's expense. That old acronym for grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. And when Christ is welcomed, we are justified by grace. When Christ is welcomed, we are also, see here in the text, having been justified by grace, we may become heirs. We're adopted, adopted into the family of God. We become His children. We now stand in a privileged and anticipatory position And as a result, we're to reflect the Father's character. And then third, when is it that we are saved? We become heirs with the hope of eternal life. When Christ is welcomed, we are saved with a hope for the future of unending life with God. And there is this new hope that comes through such. And as we think of this concept for a second here at the end of the text of eternal life with God, that there's this hope there that is there. I think we can sometimes get our ideas off just a little here, thinking perhaps of this as an interminable worship service. But when I think of this hope, I think of a story R.G. Lee used to tell. Anyone know the name R.G. Lee? Just a handful. R.G. Lee was pastor of Bellevue Baptist Church in the first half of the 20th century. And R.G. Lee tells a story of a time when he went to his mom and he asked his mom what the happiest she had ever been was when he was just a little boy. And he says, Mama, tell me the happiest day of your life. He said, I thought perhaps she would tell me about the times when my daddy, a tall man with dark eyes, spoke to her about his love out of the garden gate, but she didn't mention that. He said, I thought maybe she would tell me about the time over by the corner of the porch where he proposed to her and asked her to be his bride, but she didn't tell me that. He said, I thought maybe she would tell me about the time when they stood in a little cottage and made their wedding vows, but she didn't tell me that. She said, son, you've asked me a hard question, but I want to tell you what I believe was the happiest day of my life. She said, I was a little girl. There was a war between the states, between the north and the south. My daddy, your grandfather, went off to fight in the war. We stayed home. The women had to work in the fields. She said, we got our coffee from parched corn, our tea from sassafras tea. We got our salt from the floor of the smokehouse. We just had enough to live on. We reserved word that your granddaddy, my daddy, had been killed in the war. She said, I remembered my mother. She didn't cry much when she heard that. I wonder if she really cared. And then Lee said, she said, I would hear her at nighttime putting her face in the pillow, just sobbing her heart out. And Dr. Lee's mother said, and my heart was broken as a little girl because my mama's heart was broken and my daddy was dead. She said, then one day, we were sitting on the front porch at the old river home. She said, my mama had a bowl of, er, uh, Lee says, my mama had a bowl of beans that she was snapping and straining those beans. And she said, and she said, as she looked across down the river road, she saw a man walking and said to me, I declare that looks like your father, that man. She kept snapping the beans. Then after a while, the the grandmother said to Archie Lee's mother, Elizabeth, look, he walks just like your daddy. And I said, oh, now, mom, dad's dead. Don't get yourself upset. And then she said, that man crossed a little cotton patch and started towards the house. And my mama threw those beans in the air. They went all over the porch. And she said, Elizabeth, it's your daddy. And he had one arm that was gone, his sleeve pinned up, walking across the cotton field. And she said, my mama ran out there, embraced my dad, and they kissed and hugged. And he put that one arm he had left around her, and he held her up close. 
Then Lee's mom said, I ran as fast as my little legs would carry me and put my hand around my daddy's knees and hugged him and reached my hand up that empty sleeve and felt that funny little arm. And she said to Dr. Lee, son, I believe that was the happiest day of my life. But friends, you just wait till we see Jesus face to face, till we have eternal life with him. The eternal life we've been welcomed into by him, that we've been adopted into as his heirs. That's the promise that we have. That's why anyone can be saved. And that's what we're hoping for in our salvation. And what is our response to it? Verse 8, this saying is trustworthy. I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed God might be careful to devote themselves to good works. How is it we are supposed to respond to the grace of Jesus, to the happiest moment we can ever imagine being so much more blessed and hopeful than beyond that? We are to respond with good works, which are verses 2 and 3, or verses 1, 2, and 3. Ready for every good work, slandering no one, avoiding fighting, being kind, always showing gentleness to all people. For we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, detesting one another. Friends, anyone can be saved. Anyone can be saved. Why? Because it's the Father's plan. How? Through the Spirit's cleansing and empowering. When? When the, sweat, when the Son is welcomed. When we believe in the verse, words of verse 8, in Him. Eight months later, that London pastor was preaching in Sydney. He asked the local Baptist minister if he knew of a little elderly white-haired man who handed out tracts on Strode Street. He replied, yes, I do. His name is Mr. Jenner, although I don't think he does it anymore because he's so frail and elderly. Two nights later, they went to meet him in his little apartment. They knocked on the door, and this tiny, frail old man greeted them. He sat them down, made them tea. He was so frail that he was slopping the tea into the saucer as his hand shook. The London preacher sat there and told him of all these accounts from the previous three years. The little man sat there with tears running down his cheeks. He told them his story. I was a sailor on an Australian warship. I was living an evil life. In a crisis, I really hit the wall. One of my colleagues, to whom I gave literal hell, was there to help me. He led me to Jesus, and the change in my life was night to day in 24 hours. I was so grateful to God, I promised God that I would share Jesus in a simple witness with at least 10 people a day. As God gave me strength, I've done that. Sometimes I was ill and couldn't do it, but I made up for it these days. I missed it other times. I wasn't paranoid about it, but I've done this for over 40 years now. In my retirement years, the best place was St. George's Street, where I saw hundreds of people a day. I got lots of rejections, but many would courteously take the tract. And only a handful of times have someone come up to me or have I been able to walk them through the full gospel. You see, friends, do you truly live and act out on this idea? Anyone can be saved. I want to challenge you today. Is there someone you know you need to go to to tell the story of Jesus, of his love, and of the salvation he offers? Because anyone can be saved. Pray with me. Gracious Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the salvation that is in him. We thank you for his kindness towards us. We pray that each of us would live in light of that kindness doing good works towards others, sharing with them the joy of your salvation. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.